do cops know that the things they do affect and steal the innocence of children's lives? You know, you, you screw with a wealthy guy, you're gonna get sued. You screw with a poor guy and they're gonna build resentment until they or someone that they know is gonna shoot you. Speaking of which, have you heard of the, uh, you heard the news about Uvalde? <laughs> they, uh, the cowards were like found innocent by an independent, independent review board or something like that. So is this a situation where they've conducted their own investigation and they've realized that they're not at fault? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's like, and they say independent, but, and then I also looked at the, what they actually said they were doing. And what they found is that the, the cops did not violate policy. Well, okay. Then you've got really crappy policies. If your policy isn't to dive in and help people who are getting hurt is what I would think. Maybe I'm being silly and ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, our, their policies are obviously going to be based on what keeps them out of trouble because they don't want them testifying and saying, oh, I uh, was out of policy. Well, if there's no policy, you can't be out of policy. And then the attorney can't cross. You know, we were talking about attorney stuff earlier today. It's like, well, then the attorney can't cross examine and say, well, isn't it true that this is against policy? No, it's not against policy. We did everything in policy. Oh, great. You could be a piece of crap. And you're in policy. Great. Like, yep. you know, and, uh, but here's the thing. If those individual government terrorists slash officers are OK with not having a policy that says we must go save children when children are in danger. I mean, I don't know, man. I feel like they should maybe just instead of shooting at other people, turn the gun around yeah. Well, and I think about the the excuse that like I, I could kind of see that if I was still you know, if I had a security agency and in my security agency, I, I would not want to have a policy that said if there's a big, huge gunfight going on, run right into it, because then when all of my employees did that and they got shot and hurt, then their families would sue me and it would be so, like I understand personnel issues in, in developing policies, but but it would seem to me that there would be something that's like it's kind of like your job to do this right. and you're going to do it in as safe of a manner as is reasonable and waiting 70 minutes is not reasonable when somebody's shooting behind you. Like, yeah. I don't know, get your crap together in 30 or 40 seconds. Maybe you don't just run straight in. Maybe you run back to your car, grab a shotgun or an AR or something, and then you come back, but you don't wait 70 minutes. Uh, are we allowed to talk about our, our, our previous experiences of, of our, our, shameful lives that we've had in our past yeah when we were thieves and such yeah extortionists um but i'm italian so let's just take that for a second being that i'm italian i, I mean it kind of made sense for me to like be an extortionist guy be an intimidator like hey oh wait oh, hey, you know <laughs> we so and i i hope there's italians that are offended by that because they'd be the first ones ever but um I think, okay, so when I was working, you know, when I was 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 um, one of the street gangs uh, that was more better funded, more better funded than the other gangs, um, you know, the uh, the very first one, Columbine, went down. And um, that was like, I don't know what day it was on, but I remember that the first weekend when school wasn't in session, I want to say it happened on a Friday because I feel like the following day, Saturday, we were pra practicing doing entries without waiting. We were we we had come up with it just in our own little town that I was working in. Said, "Hey, look, this is what we think should be best to help these children." And that is yep. simply to say, first guy that goes in, he's in uniform. He's got to go. He's got to go in. Period. And for these cowards to sit there and wait, even when there's a group of them waiting. They, they, they should be, um, I, I hope I'm taking the right role in this because there's no other role for me to take. I, I can't pretend like what they did was right. Um, it, it's simply, yeah, it, it's simply cowardice and criminal. I, I absolutely think it's criminal. So if they're going to yep. pull us over and tax us, then they should have to go in when it's, it's scary to do. Yep. And certainly there were parents willing to do it. We give up our lives for our children. And we're not paid to, and we're not, well, 
we're not, you know, the average parent isn't trained to. And so, you know, for them to, yeah, to sit out there, it's, it's unconsciousable. They, they should be fired. They should be willing to quit. They should, you know, probably, yeah, I don't know. It's yep. never yep. do that type of job again. Yeah. And, and the, I remember that technology or not technology, I guess maybe the, the knowledge has progressed since that time. I remember in the early two thousands, um, I was the only person on, on my department. There was actually one other guy in the country, Greg Crane, who was a cops in, I think, Texas. And he, we were the only two people in the country that, that I was aware of that were advocating for fighting back. Because at that time, the cops were told to teach the schools, the teachers and the kids, hey, if anybody comes in and starts shooting, uh, try to lock the doors. But more importantly, curl up and make yourself a very easy target uh, in the corner and just wait for him to come room to room and hope he doesn't get through the door. And Greg Crane and I were kind of saying, hey, wait, what if you go into a classroom and there are 15 kids who are throwing crap at your face like their books and their pencils and they're attacking you and mobbing onto you? Yeah, you're going to get a few of them, but you're not going to get all 15 of them. And what would you, from a tactical standpoint, if you were going to go in and massacre, massacre 15 people, what wouldn't you want them to do? Fight back. Right. And, and at that time, it was, no, no, you shouldn't do that. You're just going to, it'll be worse, which I think is horrible advice. So times have moved on. I think now there's more training that, yeah, sometimes you got to be the sheepdog. You got to go in. You got to make stuff happen. And then they still failed. Like, there's no excuse. There's zero excuse. Um, yeah. That, what kind of person do you think? Do you think the kind of cop that is on the street today, how has it changed from when you were a cop compared to how you think it was in the 40s, 30s, 40s, 50s uh, yeah, in LA? Yeah, I say. feel like I feel like every generation is better than the generation that follows them. You know, the old timers that would look at us. You know, the guys that I knew that were like, I was just coming into the department, the guys that were homicide sergeants or SWAT sergeants or something like that. Um, you know, they were looking at us going, ah, they don't train you guys good anymore. They don't know. You don't know how to, you know, dish out street justice. You don't know how to keep those inmates in line in the jails. You don't know how to, you know, stomp crime out and all that stuff. And and then, of course, we now see the next generation. Ah, they don't know what they're doing and they're worried about this and they're, you know, but boy, this I mean, I mean, this the Uvalde thing has really taken it to a new level because it's like, oh, we're not even going to do our job. Like, we're not only going to be worse than the generations before us. And I say worse in the sense of actually preventing people from being killed type of worse, you know, like each generation, it just they just it, it just keeps getting worse. And I don't know if if it is a perception thing or if it's a reality thing, but this certainly shows that it's a reality thing. Yep. And I do think that one of the differences that I've noticed is when I first became interested in law enforcement in my late teens, this would have been, uh, what would this be, late 80s. When I first became interested in law enforcement, I was loving the idea. I would never even thought about philosophy or anything. I love the idea of going fast in cars and not getting tickets and getting in to get in fights with people and never lose. Um, I was always a chubby kid and I was never a popular kid. I was bullied. So this was kind of my chance to not have to ever man up, but still be able to just by being on the correct team, um, you know, they, you might be able to outrun me, but you can't outrun my radio. Oh yeah. That's the team I want to be on. And, and that was what I was thinking at the time. And it made good sense when the cops were talking about, being tough with people. And, you know, they would even say then, well, back in the day, if somebody was going to mouth off to you, they knew what was coming or, you know, don't make me run. You're going to get injured. And then you just knew, even when I was a cop, you knew if, if you ran from the cops, you were going to get lumped up some. And that was part of the game. And a real gangster and a real cop kind of understood that. Um, and I'm not saying that's good. Now I look back at it and say, well, that was way out of line. But that was my sentiment at the time. Right. And then I noticed that these new people were coming on who were just these softy, um, the rats, stool pigeon, uh, horrible people. And they were like really, truly clean and they wouldn't bend the rules a little bit and work around the edges and make stuff happen. And 
Did you notice that kind of that shift throughout your career as well? Well, yeah. So like working in the jails, I was in the jails around the Rodney King time and uh, worked on the streets a little bit during those riots. So I watched the use of force change quite a bit, especially in the jail system where it was really a free for all. I mean, if you didn't walk on that red line, you were you were going to get put in an isolation cell and who knows what would happen to you or you would absolutely get thrown up against the wall. And if you crack your head on that concrete wall, you better keep walking. You can go to sick call next day or something, you know, whatever. Yep. And and so, yeah, it went from like just not having to really report anything to reporting everything, even if someone says that their leg hurts. You have to like report it on a use of force form, even if you never touched them. So, you know, extremes like like as usual, there's always the extremes. They can't find the happy medium. Um, but, but looking at this, looking at the, the school shooting stuff. So, uh, last year when my daughter was in high school in a brick and mortar school, she called me up crying because she was locked in her, in her science room and dad, dad, they said that there's a shooter on campus. They won't let us leave. I want to get to my truck, you know, and, and, and in her anxiety, she's like, crying to me and saying, they won't even let me keep my knife on me to protect myself, you know, because that's what she's thinking as a young teen. And so I'm, and so, so this year she's on online school. She's, she's doing the online school stuff and she's getting great grades. She still has a wonderful social life and no one gets to make her get locked into a classroom and told that someone might come into there and shoot her. And <laughs> I mean, why do we still have brick and mortar schools? They were able to shut them down for COVID. Just shut them down for good. It would be a huge stimulus stimulus to the economy if they started giving back uh, property taxes to property owners and stopped giving it to these schools, these brick and mortar traps, death traps that look like prisons and are built like prisons. And, and let's these kids just start doing it on their own. They, they can do great. And, you know, the bottom line is if your kid's going to be stupid, they're going to be stupid. If they're going to be smart, they're going to be smart. I'm fortunate that mine are really smart. You know, they, they took after someone that wasn't me. <laughs> um, so, you know, I yeah, I mean, I, I wish people would be looking at that more and 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 saying, like, just to get the kids out of schools. Yeah. Yep. I'm actually reading Everything Voluntary by Skylar Collins. Uh, right now it's available on Amazon. I'm not going to put a link below because uh, YouTube is not letting me put links in my descriptions anymore. They haven't told me why, but evidently I violated community policies. But anyway, uh, everything Darn. voluntary. And there are a handful of chapters in there that are dedicated just to parenting, schooling, well, schooling versus education, unschooling, that kind of stuff. And what you're saying is just, it's so right on that you're taught all this stuff for 12 years in the government indoctrination camps that never do you any good. And if you really need to learn algebra at some point for your job, well, go learn it beforehand. If you really need to learn video editing because you want to have a YouTube channel, well, go learn it. Uh, whatever it is you need to do, you can go do it. Now, if you're going to do something highly specialized, then yeah, maybe college is a good idea. Maybe more formal schooling is a good idea, but don't waste those first years on it. Go out and have fun and Go to work with mom or dad and see what they're doing and go explore well, your the neighborhood. Survival rate will be better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, chances of survival will be a lot better. Yep. Yep. So what happens now to parents who are saying, well, yeah, it's really great for you guys to say homeschool, unschool, whatever. But in our situation, we both have to work. One of us can't stay home. It must be nice to be rich, but we're not what do we do? Well, I don't know what to say to that person. Like there isn't a very good solution. It sucks that the government says you must send your kids to school or we're going to put you in a cage, which is what truancy laws are. I, I don't know what the solution is in the current system. Right. And, and I feel like, I guess I'm thinking more high school where most kids are by themselves at home anyway, a lot of the times, uh, a lot of these high schools and even some of the younger uh, grades they don't even have schools on Fridays, for example. And so it's three day weekends almost every every week. But yeah, I, I mean, do I have a solution for like the elementary and kindergarten? No, obviously not. But where they could kind of self be self-taught or log into a computer and be able to do that type of thing. It's just it's still safer than going to these other schools. And 
I don't know the percentage at all, but I think a majority of these school shootings are at high schools. I know we've had a few that aren't, but also some of it is is maybe adults coming onto the campus or someone specifically going and looking for someone else. Um, but, you know, it seems to be mainly the high schools. And if we could like minimize that, I feel like that could be good. Yeah. I, you know, it, it's just an idea that other people could poke a million holes into. Well, but I think it's a good argument for not having a centralized compulsory school system. Um, like there isn't a good solution. Here we are, two former cops. I think I'm very happy saying ex-cop. Two ex-cops who are saying, no, from a security standpoint, I was a school resource officer for a while. From a, from a, that standpoint, from a, a tactical standpoint, no, it's not as easy to protect a building with hundreds or thousands of people in them, all of whom are 100% guaranteed to be disarmed, except for maybe one person who's a school resource officer. And by the way, the coolest kids who are the best cops are not the school resource officers. The, the people who end up in that are people who are in trouble. The department doesn't want them out on the street messing up, or they've ticked somebody off or whatever. And they're, hey, you're going to go in and protect the children. And oh, the cop thinks he's great. Oh, I got a promotion. No, you got the crap job. And that everybody knows it except you. Um, well, that was the case partially for me. Of course, I was doing no, that. No, I'm laughing because the particular situation at the one high school I was referring to, uh, he used to be a sergeant, but he got promoted to school resource deputy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> promoted in a particular direction. Huh? I wonder if I had anything to do with that. <laughs> uh, you're you're kind of hoping so, huh? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So what else are you thinking about uh, kids, schooling, parenting? Yeah, uh, parenting is definitely a, a situation that could be could be uh, dealt with better, too, because, you know, we I, I do think a lot of these parents are saying, oh, yeah, just send them off to school. They'll take care of it. And no, it's not like you. <laughs> we were sitting at a pl an event today, um, you know, minimizing too much specifics, but sitting at an event where um, there were a lot of children that weren't part of the event that were just running around a lot of dogs too because this is the type of event it was and we're just dogs free roamed and children free roamed and you know you're watching this and like i'm a little intolerable about that because it's just like who's watching these kids and why are they screaming for no reason you know and it's like <laughs> these a lot of people actually plan to have kids um and, and it's it's interesting because then they just kind of once they're like old enough to walk or wipe their own butts they just are like oh okay i guess we're done with them now we can go do our own little thing and, you know let them just run around and i don't know in the state i'm in there is a thing called child trafficking but i guess they're not worried about it so <laughs> i don't know you know i love seeing the little beggars running around being wild and crazy and free and making mistakes and falling down and getting along with each other or fighting or whatever they're gonna do it, it's something, though, that all this preaching I do for unschooling or uh, and, and these extremist libertarian humanitarian type philosophies, who do I really want to uh, who, who do I really want to babysit? Do I want to babysit some conservative Republican corporal punished uh, kids who go to a private Christian school that's very strict? Do I want to babysit them for four hours while the parents go out to dinner? Or do I want to babysit an unschooled kid who is just their own free, wonderful human being? Not a freaking chance. Those little boogers are just all over the place and crazy like humans should be. But yeah. it's just, yeah. Oh my gosh. That's just such a, yeah. Cause I've had some bad experiences with that. And it's like, yeah, if you don't have that strong control, but then that brings up something that I was thinking of the other day about how dogs and wives and horses and children do behave a lot better when they are beaten. However, we probably shouldn't do that to any of them because it ain't right. So, yeah, maybe you'll get dinner on the table every night at five o'clock if you beat your wife, but don't do it. It's wrong. And then I think the same thing about kids, if you're going to beat your kids or, or hit them or pull them or whatever. Don't do it. It's wrong. Yes, they are going to be much better behaved, obedient, docile. They're going to be better docile slaves. Shepherd will be willing to babysit for you. But don't do that. Let them be themselves. Let them be awesome little human beings. Right. 
Okay, here's an ADD moment. I watched this reel and then I tried it to see if it works. If you type in the Google search bar and you say, um, what do I do if my wife is yelling at me? And it'll give you a whole suggestions of what you need to do to change yourself so that your wife doesn't yell at you. Now, if you, in contrast, say, what do I do if my husband is yelling at me? It gives you the domestic violence hotline. <laughs> Dude, it, it, like legitimately. Yep. Crazy. Yep. Yep. So, it's interesting. Well, it's interesting. Some of the stuff Jordan Peterson has talked about, about how, how it is that, that men are definitely way more violent than women. Um, and I happen to believe that there is a difference between men and women. And I know it's, it's edgy, but I, I think there's a difference in how our brains work and such. And it, it is so true that a, a woman's best tool is not her superior upper body strength and her punching speed. So that's not what she's going to use as a tool. Her tool is a very different tool. So she's going to use that tool. And we are all very different. Very are you talking about like a tool like the Bobbit situation? Yeah, <laughs> different kind of tool than that. I'm thinking more of the uh, manipulative, gossipy kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, on a, a little more serious note, you know, I had what I'm going to refer to as my stoner thought the other night. Of course, I would never use illegal drugs. I only use legal ones that are prescribed by doctors that will really screw me up. But, um, <laughs> and, and a lot of, of stoners actually do use legal drugs. But, um, <laughs> and talking about kids and talking about cops. and what what I, I came to the realization of with my personal experiences without getting into those is do my I guess the rhetorical question, do cops know that the things they do affect and steal the innocence of children's lives? And I just wonder, because some cops, in fact, I would even say most cops have a good heart. They're confused. They don't understand things. They are maybe have lower IQs like you and I um, <laughs> did. I mean, I think we increased them. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but like, do they do they truly know what they have done to the children's innocence by their behaviors? Not the children's behaviors, not the parents' behaviors, but by the cops' behaviors. What they do steals children's innocence. And I, I just, if not, and there's some cops that somehow found a way to watch this, I hope they think about that the next time they have an interaction with a kid. And I told you on another episode uh, when I've made some mistakes in that, I won't get into it again today, but um, you know, where, where I, I was, was wrong in the things that I've said in front of children and stuff. And you know, they don't, I, I don't recall training and I'm going to, I'm willing to bet that there's probably no training on, how to keep a child's innocence intact when at a domestic violence call or, you know, whatever else it might be. I guess and there's not a four hour or even a 30 second to block yep. <laughs> in the academy these days for that. So, yep. And that would be useful. Um, yeah, that would, because some of the things that the. You know what they do do, though, is the op awesome, 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 awesome propaganda of school resource officers and officer friendly. And they kind of get these kids to think, oh, well, cops are nice. They're the ones who give me donuts at school and make jokes about themselves. They're the nice people, um, which is not not ideal, I don't think. Um, yeah. I don't like the idea of, of kids thinking, oh, if there's a problem, call a cop. Well, no, solve the problem. And then if absolutely everything else fails, then maybe you call in today's society, then you call a cop, but not right off the bat. Yeah. Uh, information I've gotten from, let's call it female senior high schoolers, and I would relate to that as being uh, one of my daughters, is that um, the school resource officers generally are male and seem to be somewhat creepy around <laughs> the high school girls. So... Yeah, I mean, as far as like what impression they're really leaving, and I don't know, man. I, I, I mean, my my kids have a healthy distrust of of law enforcement, uh, unfortunately, and that's law enforcement's doing. That's no one else's because heck, their father was a cop, and they should be, you know, they should have like a "Don't Tread on Me" sticker with a 
blue lined flag <laughs> next to it saying that we love we love extortionists and we want our freedom. Yes, exactly. <laughs> to show that they're thoroughly confused. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We're from the government. We're here to give you your freedoms. <laughs> I like it. Hey, let's talk about our uh mutual friend James Freeman. Oh, um, what a great guy. So Here's here's a thought. I, I watch his videos sometimes, and I and so of course now that the the YouTubes know that that's what they need to feed me, so they're feeding me these all these different people uh, doing this First Amendment auditing, cop watching, et cetera, et cetera. I have a fear about what they're doing. So years and years ago, back I think I was still a cop at the time. I got a hold of Pete Ayer, who was the like the OG of cop block cop watching way back in the day. And I said, Hey, come to my state where I'm a police officer in a little department. I think you're getting us wrong. Come out and go on a ride along with me. And I think you'll think differently. Well, it turns out that, you know, fast forward a dozen years and I get to, we kind of stayed in touch lately, got to meet him at an anarchist convention in Phoenix. And, and we've remained friends since then and, and hung out over the years and I, I've thought the whole, with the beginning of the time, I thought this is just horrible what these cop block people are doing and they're going out and they're just upsetting cops. And now I look at the change in the last 20 years of the public's perception toward cops. And I'm like, what a fast change from at least what I thought I saw is back in the early 2000s People generally thought cops are heroes. They're there to save you and help you. And yeah, they're probably not as bright as most people, but they're not bad people. And they're overall pretty good and we should respect them. And occasionally one of them will mess up, but it's not like it's all the time. Well, these guys have exposed him. Uh, Pete, James, all the other people, they've exposed what the real deal is. And it's not an occasional error that cops make what are your thoughts about that, that whole movement of is it good is it bad in the long run yeah i think you and i were talking about uh like tiktok or the reels or something like that and you know if you get on the certain on a certain vibe on tiktok it keeps showing you things that yeah like like we we're saying that they think you're interested in and um you know there's a lot of police misconduct videos that show up on tiktok and uh, I, I think that like social media has helped expose the lies of, you know, all cops are good. And at least in the conversations I have with upper middle class white people, let's just say it as it is like they're they're very hesitant. Even the ones that have the pro cop American flags on the back of their trucks, they're very hesitant to say all cops are good. They're always willing to say, well, you know, they mean good or well, they they um, most of them are. Oh, they have good hearts. Well, OK, great. We all have good intentions, but sometimes, you know, those don't last very long. Um, so I feel like there is a definite shift in people in general opening up their eyes. And of course, as the younger generations are becoming more and more likely to question authority and question law enforcement and different things like that. Um, and and so I, I think that's a good thing. Yeah. I, I think, I think my, what oh. you're, sorry, real quick. And I think what your guys are doing, the people you're talking about, and I don't want to, I don't want to like brag, but I actually met James. <laughs> uh, if we could just take like sit for a second in that. Whoa. Yeah. So <laughs> nice guy. And I hope he's watching this because I hope <laughs> we can hang out with him again. Um, but I, I think what they're doing is fabulous. And it takes guts because I consider myself not a tough guy, but but certainly a guy willing to take risks on occasions. Man, some of the stuff that he does is like, oh man, I don't know if I can pull that off. Yeah. Like I'm all good for talking trash, but like I don't be putting your hands on me. Like, don't take me to jail. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> sir. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm definitely afraid. I definitely out of fear comply. That's yep. that's the main reason, you know. Yep. And so the the only thing that I can think of that could be a bad backlash, or, or there are a couple things that I, I worry about. I don't think it's worth not doing it because of this, but one thing would be it's harder and harder to find cops these days. 
And one of the big reasons is, you know, you're so heavily scrutinized. You can just do your job in a very nice, perfect, easygoing, fun, friendly, wonderful way. And you're still going to be given crap by a lot of the auditors. Some auditors will wait until a cop turns that corner and then they go full ape crap on them. Others are just jerks right from the beginning. And so nobody wants to be a cop. Well, governments need people to enforce their, their desires. And so there are going to be enforcers out on the streets. There are going to be people carrying guns, making sure what the government wants happens. If you can't get enough kinder, gentler cops who are trained and have to obey case law and all this stuff, I predict that it's we're going to start seeing more and more National Guard, Marines, something like that. You're going to have a car with the brains. <laughs> this is weird, funny to say. The brains of the operation is the cop. And then the brawn of the operation is the tough guy with the AR. And he's kind of there just for officer safety purposes. So now you've employed more people. You, you get the, the military can recruit people who maybe weren't quite passing their intellectual standards currently. They could lower the standards a little bit, get those people in, assign them to be with a cop. And I think that could spell disaster way worse. Uh, military dudes who think that, hey, these are really tough times. So for five years, we've got to suspend some of these things like this whole, you know, Fifth Amendment stuff in this. No, that crap isn't happening now. Uh, that could be very scary. Do you yeah. have any concerns about that kind of thing happening? I mean, I, I definitely think that we're on a slippery slope. Something, you know, whether it's, you know, as as the crazies will say, the blue helmets, you know, end up showing up to deal with things instead of your average street cop or, you know, it's more federalized. Uh, they they talked about federalizing law enforcement. I forget when, but, um, you know, there's so much federal money going to local law enforcement that they pretty much have to do what the feds tell them anyway. So, yeah, I, I feel like it's it's just it, it is probably right around the corner. And. The only the only thing I, I expect is people are continually the average person is continually willing to stand up more and more, I think, against government overreach because they're seeing so many videos and it's kind of getting, you know, told to them over and over that they they're really we're we're becoming a society that is questioning authority more and more. And, and we're documenting it. Most most people I know record if they're pulled over, it's it's being recorded. Maybe not yep. video, but audio. audio. Yep. So that's, that's so smart. I, I think that's a positive. That's definitely a positive. Yeah. Yeah. And then the uh, the the other thing that worries me is that laws, case law laws could be changed by legislatures to say, OK, we used to say you could just request records and we'll give them to you. But now people are taking advantage of it and people are just doing way too many records requests. The cops are inundated with now all the guy, people can't be on the streets. They've got to be in the records division, pulling out all these stuff and making photocopies. I guess they don't do that anymore. But I, I can see them saying, because of this, we're going to change the rules. And it's a one year waiting period until you get a report that you request or something like that. Right. Um, that's another concern that that I think that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction or something to that effect. Um, what is going to happen? This isn't just going to happen and the government's going to go, oh, doggone it. Looks like we're weak now. Like, what's their move going to be? I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's interesting. I'm sorry. There's a huge spider staring at me right now, and I'm a little freaked out. I, I'm just going to be completely blunt. <laughs> is that what you're looking down at? I mean, give me a sec here. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Live TV. Yeah. Hey, you know what? Former officer safety is what it's all about. Thanks <laughs> for making that happen. Thank you for your service. <laughs> hey, everyone's a little more protected because I'm safe. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, that's perfect. And I keep looking down because my cats, obviously I have cats. I'm, I'm libertarian. My cats are making all kinds of noise. I'll tell you, animals in our lives, they're, they bring us joy, whether they're spiders or cats. They, they that's, bring us that's moments. true. One, <laughs> one dies for us and one, yeah. <laughs> so what else are you thinking about these days? What's your brain been noodling on? You want to, okay, this is going to be random and you can even cut this part out. But what I was thinking the other day, and I was going to tell you this or like send you a, a video message or not video, but a voice message. Um, do you ever wonder if you should like, okay, a lot of people legally carry firearms in their vehicle. Um, do you ever think about wiping off the prints of your gun before you put it wherever you're going to each time you put it in your car in case for some reason you are ever shot and a cop gets into your car, sees that you have a gun and then says that, that you were drawing that gun and that's why they shot you. Interesting. Interesting. Is that, I mean, maybe that's a different level of paranoia or maybe that's just too much information that I've got in my little brain. Yeah. I don't know how people are, but... Yeah. yeah, that is an interesting many, many times cops have had done actions and then kind of like went back to build the reason for their actions. You know, I mean, we all we all know that like a cop will pull you out of the car, search the vehicle. And once they find the drugs, they'll decide that you were under the influence because, of course, now they know you're a drug user because you got, you know, meth in your car or something like that. And so yep. now based on their training experience, you're under the influence and that's why they search your car. And now you're going to jail, you know. Yep. Or like my FTO told me in Southern California, uh, um, field training officer, when he said, pull that car over and then I said, why would they do? And he says, you'll figure it out by the time you get up to their window. <laughs> and I think that at least back in the day, that it's probably still, especially in bad areas, um, that's probably still the case. Um, yeah, I, I, we were taught to lie. Uh, as recently as five or 10 years ago, a guy who I, I work with now, he said that he knows this, they're very devout Christian folks. This guy was got a job at the, the big university in the state as a university cop. After the, he went through the academy. He gets back and he's having the a talk with the chief. And he says, just so you know, we were told in the academy to lie, that like it was okay for cops to lie and such. And the chief says, well, yeah, you have to. You know, to, sometimes you have to if you're going to get good information out of people or whatever. And the guy says, no, he says, I'm a Christian. I don't lie. It's, it's against my religion. It's against my principles. I'm not going to do that. And the chief says, well, you're joking, right? Like, you know, you have to. And the guy said, no. And he says, if this isn't going to work out, I get it. And he left the department because he was going to be forced to lie as part of his job. And I certainly lied to a lot of people. It was a great tool because people think you're going to be honest. What a great switcheroo there. Oh, it's an right. honest cop. Yeah, right. Completely the opposite. So, yeah, I think I think the gun with prints, there's so many things like that that, gosh, but and then how are, how's it going to be planted? And that is actually something that I've never seen in my career. I never saw anything planted on a person who, even if you arrested him and things didn't go well, you wouldn't claim that there was right. something that it wasn't. But there oh, yeah. were things that were, you know, maybe you smelled the alcohol, maybe it wasn't alcohol you smelled, kind of thing. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, fortunately for me, I never worked with anyone, nor did I ever actually do any planting of evidence. I mean, everyone that went to jail, whether it was legal to take them to jail or not, they were they were definitely committing a crime. But whatever crime that was, it was the crime that the politicians told us where it was illegal. And, and that's why we're enforcing it. You know, I mean, yep. it starts with a seatbelt and then goes to like prostitution or drug use, which doesn't hurt anyone. Yep. You know, yep. Except for the, except for the spouse at home that's waiting. So as cops, we would lie. We know that um, even though we didn't plant anything, we would lie. Um, what do you think about this, this idea of there are bad people in the world and like, like, it's really easy for me now in my little Rocky Mountain community. It's not even a town. It is so easy to forget that there are some really hardcore folks who have spent 30 years in prison, getting stabbed, stabbing others, lying, cheating, doing uh, like really bad dudes who want to kill and they just don't even blink an eye. It's yeah. easy for me to be kind of insulated and not remember what it's really like in a bad part of a big city. How, how, how do you reconcile that idea of 
you can't just send cute little lamb cops out who are going to obey every rule and pe- treat people with respect. Like they'll get stomped on so quickly by some con. Uh, it just, it, 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 you can't be like that in those neighborhoods. Um, you can in Beverly Hills, you can in, you know, places like that, but you can't in the hood. How, how is that reconciled? Like, how do you be a badass and protect the community without bending rules? Well, I think that that con that's, you know, been in prison for 30 years, the reason he hates cops is because of the way he's been treated or people he cares about have been treated poorly. And and so that's why they want to, you know, eat them up and spit them out type of thing, whatever cop comes into contact with them. And and that's why these cops need to but need to be, you know, tough and and ready. But um but if if you could ever change the culture of law enforcement to not have society hating them so much, and when I say society, quite honestly, the inner city, the lower class, the less wealthy, um, you know, you, you screw with a wealthy guy, you're going to get sued. You screw with a poor guy, and they're going to build resentment until they or someone that they know is going to shoot you. And so... Again, I, I think a lot of it all goes back to the culture. If if we could stop having our field training officers be guys that were trained by their field training officers, who were trained by their field training officers, you know, because it is, it's just like this, it's it's just this constant, like, we're going to train you to do it the way the other guys did it, even though it doesn't work, because that's the only way we know, because we've never tried it any other way. So it's a culture of that, that ex-con ready to fight with whatever cop shows up. And that's why that cop has to be ready, especially in these worse areas. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 a lot of it, I think, has to do with just the culture of what law enforcement or even just the culture mm-hmm. of cops and robbers, cowboys and Indians. Sorry to say it, not to say that Indians were bad. Maybe the cowboys were. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that good and good versus evil. And mm-hmm. It's so, yeah, I mean, until we can break that and break that type of of culture, I think it's going to be tough to to figure out any other type of solution. But exposing them for what they do is important. Yep, I think you're right. To let society know how cops behave behind closed doors or behind the scenes or in the alleyways is important. And. I hope and wish that like if there's former cops that, that are listening to this, that maybe are starting to realize the things they've done in the past. You know, it's almost like a, a recovering alcoholic, I feel like. The, the the few of us that have chatted about it, we have some friends that are former military, former law enforcement that have really looked back and said, oops, I, I, I didn't do right. And and the people, not because of what I chose, but because of what I what I like what I chose to do. Not my specific singular actions here and there, but like the overall action of, you know, helping our United States, uh, you know, invade a country that's not hurting us or kicking in the door for someone who was using drugs that didn't hurt anyone. You know, just different things like that. Martial law during the Rodney King riots. Um, You know, it's just, yeah. Yep. Yep. And that's something that I have found has been so welcoming in this uh, I don't know that it's a community, but kind of the humanitarian movement, voluntarist, anarcho-capitalist, whatever you call it, libertarian, is the welcoming spirit of people that, especially in my first years, I was like, I feel horrible. I, like, how do I pay back to society, costing society a hundred grand a year for ten years, and all of the speeding tickets I wrote, and and the all the people's whose lives I messed up, the person who I gave a a little stop sign ticket to who then couldn't afford to renew their registration, who the next week got a more expensive registration thing, which then stressed them out and they were more snappy at work and they got fired. And like the, the chain reaction of what we did had some really bad consequences that we never thought of. And we still don't know how far that reaches, but the community has been so great about saying, yeah, Chef, you're asking what you, what we want from you, Shepard, just quit it. Just don't do it anymore. You've already quit. Just 
don't do that anymore. You've, you've apologized. Thanks for that. We accept it. Let's let's move on now. You, you don't owe us anything. And so that's something that I would like to pass on to people who are thinking about um, become elevating yourself above this whole state of nature thing, like the whole anti-subjectivist manifesto thing. Like you want to elevate yourself and get to that next level where you can look somebody in the eye and say, yeah, I've messed up. And now um, I'm going to mess up a lot less. I'm still going to mess up. But now it's not going to be an intentional thing. Like there's a whole tribe of humanity that's just waiting to say, yeah, come on in, brother. It's all good. And I love that. Have you noticed that too? Yeah. Yeah. I have. Yeah. And even, you know, I get a kick out of going to, you know, the local watering hole and, and um, there's, there's usually just, you know, it's kind of a filled with older kind of retired ish people and in a kind of somewhat conservative area who are, you know, they're, they're the typical don't tread on me with the, with the blue flag, blue line through the American flag type people. And, and I get a kick out of, of chatting with them and, and most of them very respectful. Most of them don't, get uptight about it and, you know, want to hear a different point of view than Fox news. Um, and, and by the, you know, how many times I've talked to them about my voluntarist position or mindset and, and how they'll look at me just, just, just dead on and say, yeah, I believe that too. And I had a guy say that to me yesterday or not yesterday it was last week anyway and he's like yeah man we uh we, we're a lot alike I, I i agree with what you're saying we're a lot alike i'm like are we really great then i expect you won't be voting <laughs> and he looks at me and he goes well yeah i'm gonna vote i'm like oh okay i mean yep. well, i'm not gonna tell him not i mean it's his choice right like yeah but like he, they want to say oh yeah we're a lot alike we're a lot alike great then stop voting oh yep. well but it's my right. Yeah. There's that, there's that huge shift, isn't there for the, for the philosophic understanding. And yeah, I hear you, man. I have heard that. If I've heard it once, I've heard it a hundred times of, Hey man, we're really close. I even made a video some years ago about this. And it's like, yeah. no, if, if you believe that it's okay for some people to tell other people who haven't agreed to it, what to do, that puts you on one side. The opposite side says, no, there shouldn't be any unapproved rulers. Like if you haven't asked somebody to tell you what to do, they don't get to tell you what to do. So that's one side and the other side is very different. Now, within this side, we have these huge differences between people on opposite sides of the aisle. Like, I think you sh people should be taxed 37%. And the other person just inflamed. No, that's so sick and wrong. It should be 36%. We're on opposite sides. No, you guys over here are not on opposite sides. You're on the same side. We, the voluntarists, the anarcho-capitalists, we are on the other side. And so many people think they're close and they're not. But I guess that's the black pill. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is. I think it's fun for people to hear a different point of view and they would love to embrace that. They're just afraid to actually do anything with it, you know? So. Yep. Yep. And I guess the white pill side of that is maybe we don't care if everybody has the same intellectual understanding as long right. as their behaviors are cool. And if you say, Hey man, just so you know, if, uh, if you ever, if you're not hurting anybody and the cops come and ask me to ratchet out, I'll never do that to you. Hey, just so you know, and so your neighbors know that if their music's too loud, you're not calling the cops on them. If you see them doing a uh, selling the marijuanas or something on the in the street, you're not going to call the cops on them. And it's like that's a good step. Mm -hmm. And then the step of, hey, if you ever need help, you know, fixing your shed, you need me to hold a wall up while you nail it or whatever. Let me know. I'm around. And then I think that kind of thing, that's the white pill. Human beings are good. Yeah, I mean, I would rather not call the cops when someone's driving fast down my street. I'd rather steal a spike strip and wait for them to drive down next time. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. You know? Problems are solved, right? <laughs> Conflict <laughs> equilibrium is... Uh... In a way, we use law enforcement to help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Retired law enforcement. <laughs> well, no, because we used one of their spike strips we stole from the back. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I think I still have my set of keys for the... Um, for the 96 Chevys. Beautiful. <laughs> you can get in. <laughs> they were all the same. the same. They all yeah. worked for all the cars in the station. <laughs>
you know, that might be a crime because you have just very specifically said what you're going to do. So when you go find a 1996 <laughs> patrol car, oh boy. Yeah. Oh, well. Well, man, it's been fun chatting. Let's do this more often. I'm sorry we don't uh, we do not do it more. It's fun reliving the old times and uh, kind of thinking through stuff and tossing ideas around. And yeah, I appreciate it. Same here. And again, if anyone happens to be watching that, that used to be law enforcement, come on over. It's it's the water's warm and it's nice over here. There's a little bit of guilt, but you know what? All your friends will have the same guilt. We'll, uh, we'll sit around the fire and throw it in and watch it burn. Yep. Amen, brother.